What's up guys, Dalmatter here, and today we're going to be reacting to another Romabu Ramblings video. So this one is kind of interesting because obviously, you know, the Byzantines, you know, the, the late Roman Empire, whatever you want to call it, um, they spoke Greek, right? Latin was still, for part of it at least, a legal language, uh, liturgical language, but, uh, you know, mostly they spoke Greek, uh, especially during the later parts. But this is interesting. I did not. I've never heard this before. But uh, it's did Byzantine emperor call Latin barbarian language? Uh, I'm not sure who this is referring to. Which emp emperor? Uh, looks like this is from a TV show. Uh, at least the first frame. So I'm guessing it's from some some show. But I'm not entirely sure. But anyway, link to the original video down below, and let's jump into it. Tell me if you have heard the story before. Byzantine Emperor Michael III called Latin a barbarian language. It's an anecdote that hangs. Oh, a Scythian language? That's funny. The official language of the HRE was Latin until Heracles changed it to Greek. Oh, the ERE, I thought this said HRE. Therefore, it is not barbaric to speak Latin. Encounter quite often, mostly as a supposed proof of how the Byzantines weren't actually Romans and rejected everything from classical Rome. It always struck me as suspicious since I know for a fact that Michael oh, kept using Latin in his coinage. So I decided to put the story into context, and here's what I found. First, let's figure out where the story comes from. If you try and look for a direct quote where Emperor Michael... I'm guessing this is like Western propaganda, like West Western European propaganda, like to from sometime in the Middle Ages to attempt to uh, justify like either the HRE or some other country being the true successor to Rome. Michael III calls the, Latin a oh. barbarian language. You're not going to find anything. Our only source for this statement is the response to it, which oh, was sent by Pope Nicholas oh. in the year 865. This exchange of letters happened during a diplomatical conflict between Constantinople and Rome, known as the Photian Schism. The Photian Schism started when Michael asked Pope Nicholas to mediate a dispute over who should be the Patriarch of Constantinople. It started off relatively benign and friendly. The Pope had sent his delegates, who didn't want to cause any trouble, and they confirmed the Emperor's appointee, Photius. Nicholas, however, wanted to flex his diplomatic muscle, so he rejected the verdict, excommunicated his own delegates, held his own council, and declared that Photius' appointment was unlawful. <laughs> Things really heated up when the question of Bulgaria got thrown into the mix. The Bulgarian Han Boris wanted to convert his nation to Christianity, and both the Patriarch and the Pope wanted to have spiritual authority over the newly Christian Bulgarians. The rhetoric got so harsh that at one point Pope Nicholas used the most vile insult imaginable. In his letter to Forty- Man, this is one thing I always find funny, is how much, you know, religious matters are often just secular matters, but religion is basically used as... Um, like propaganda warfare, essentially, right? It's, it's, it's like ancient geopolitical psyops, essentially. Is in addition to being a fratricide and a snake, he accused the patriarch of being a Jew, and also the Antichrist. <laughs> the infamous exchange with Michael's comments about the Latin language took place around the same time. As I've said before, we don't have the original letter from Michael, so we have to try and figure out its contents from the response. The author of the response mentions Michael's remark no fewer than six times. Apparently, the emperor called Latin not only barbaric, but also a Scythian language. All the papal retorts have this polemical and slight- Thus insulting the one who created it. While well, at the beginning of your letter you call yourself a Roman emperor, but you are not afraid to call the Roman language barbaric. Stop calling yourself Imperator uh, Romanorum. Because, in your opinion, barbarians are those whose emperor you claim to be. Indeed, this language is used by the Romans, which you call barbaric and Scythian. Slightly passive-aggressive tone. You have broken out into such a fury that you are attacking the Latin language in I your see, letter, yeah. calling it barbaric and Scythian, thus insulting the one who created it. We are sorry that your excellency is not jeopardized by the fact that they are Christians whose language you call barbaric and Scythian. Pope. Because the barbarians and the Scythians live like mindless animals, they ignore the true god and worship the woods and stones. <laughs> Finally, if you call barbaric that language because it creates barbarisms when it is rendered by translators into Greek, the mistake. 
in our opinion, is not due to the Latin language, but due to the translators who did not render sense for sense as they should, but impetuously word for word. Uh, man, that honestly is like one of the biggest problems when it comes to like translating between different languages. It, it, it's always fascinating how, especially in like a religious context, which obviously this is kind of what this is about, but people will directly translate word for word, and a lot of the time that doesn't really work because if it's like something that's a matter of speech, it might not make sense, or like a pun might not make sense. You know, certain jokes might not make sense in another language because just the way they're worded doesn't make sense, right? Um, anyway, but if you call the Latin language barbaric because you do not understand it, think how ridiculous you are to call yourselves Roman emperors without knowing the Roman language. Get them. Popular historians generally take these comments at face value and jump to a conclusion that Michael actually insulted the Latin language and called it barbaric and Scythian. Yeah, this might just be like the, you know, ninth century version of like a Twitter debate where they're literally just arguing past each other and just arguing at straw men that neither one of them ever said. All right? Have you ever, you ever watched two fucking people go at it on Twitter? Half the time, they, they don't even address each other's points. They just create straw men, and they're both, like, attacking the straw man that they created, never actually attacking the arguments of the person they're talking to. But I think we should take a moment and investigate the circumstances surrounding this exchange. The main thing making me skeptical of this popular interpretation is the person of the author. The letter wasn't written by Pope Nicholas himself, but by his secretary, Anastasius the Librarian. And this Anastasius was quite a character. <laughs> Despite his Greek name, Anastasius doesn't come from a Greek-speaking family. Some of his translations contain mistakes which couldn't have been made by a native speaker. The record of one of his trials also mentions Likely an uncle by the name Frank of Edo which would suggest a Frankish ancestry. His family was well connected in the church, so Anastasius was slated for a solid ecclesiastical career. However, his ambitions were much grander. So, so basically he's, this dude is like a, a, a five IQ fucking rich kid who got appointed to this position, even though he has like shouldn't be just because he's, you know, related to some fucking Frankish nobles. When he got an appointment which may have hindered his path to the papal throne, he refused to take it and abandoned his church post. For this, he was excommunicated and anathematized. But the papacy wasn't getting rid of him that easily. Anastasius's uncle was an influential bishop with good connections at the court of the Frankish emperor. In 855, during a papal interregnum, he convinced the emperor to make his nephew an imperial antipope. Anastasius entered Rome on a horseback at the head of an armed force, installed himself on a papal throne, and burned the frescoes depicting the council at which he had been excommunicated. <laughs> However, he didn't have any support within the city, so only after three days was forced out and <laughs> This would have put an end to the career of other men, but not of Anastasius. He had to spend a couple of years in the monastery, but in 858, the new Pope Nicholas I brought him in to be his secretary. Apparently, his language skills were so indispensable that the papacy was willing to overlook his record of making trouble. Okay, so he was amb- Which is kind of ironic because they just said that he was terrible at translations. I'm, maybe he's talking about between like Frankish and Latin or German and Latin. Uh, I'm assuming, because it's clearly not between Greek and Latin. Vicious and kind of a troublemaker. This isn't anything too extraordinary, so why would I be especially suspicious of him? That is because Anastasius was never shy about his attitude to the Eastern Roman Empire. Essentially, he's an OG Byzantines aren't real Romans guy. <laughs> A lot of arguments you'd hear denying the Romanness of the Byzantines originate from him. Here's what Anastasius wrote later in his life as the secretary to the Carolingian Emperor Louis II. The Greeks, for their cacodoxy, that is wrong thinking, have ceased to be the emperors of the Romans. Not only have they deserted the city and the capital of the empire, but they have also abandoned Roman nationality and even the language. They have migrated to another capital and taken up a completely different nationality and language. On another occasion, he writes that Louis has a better claim to the title bestowed by the Pope, whereas the East's the so-called emperors were sometimes acclaimed by the Senate, the people, and the armies. This is hilarious. The so-called. It reminds me of like black nationalists whenever they uh, 
the, you know, the so-called English, the so-called, you know, Vikings, the, the so-called Egyptians. They, they always say that shit, right? What is it with, like, historical revisionists and always saying the so-called? Title of Roman Emperor, because it was bestowed on him by the Pope. Whereas in the East, the so-called emperors were sometimes acclaimed by the Senate, the people, and the armies. In his correspondence with the Pope, he writes that deceit is a custom of the Greeks, <laughs> so we can be sure that his attitude to the Eastern Empire was the same during his service in the Papal Secretariat. So we have a Papal Secretary who is not particularly fond of the Eastern Romans, penning a letter to the Emperor at a time of diplomatic tension between Rome and Constantinople. I think it's fair to assume that he might have willfully misinterpreted and exaggerated the insult of the original statement. And some of the context actually shows through all of the faint outrage of Anastasius' response. In one of the six mentions of- So yeah, I, I was kind of right, right? This is like Twitter politics 101. Pretend somebody said something way worse than they, they actually did, or way different than they actually did, so you can dunk on that, right? Oh my god, it, it's so cringe. Man, I guess, that, you know, the more things change, the more they stay the same. Finally, if you call it barbaric, the language because it creates barbarisms. Oh, okay, so this is one that we saw earlier. ...of the supposed insult, he writes the following. Finally, if you call barbaric that language because it creates barbarisms when it's rendered by the translators into Greek, the mistake, in our opinion, is not due to the Latin language, but to the translators who did not render sense for sense as they should but impetuously word for word. This hints at the notion that Michael's comment was not targeted at the Latin language itself, but at the way it was being used by the Western clergy. More specifically, it might have been a comment on the version of Latin used by the papacy. Latin in the 9th century wasn't a unified and codified language like classical Latin. There were multiple variants of it, some of which later became the Romance languages, and others which formed the basis of the modern-day Church Latin. The Western clergy at the time was predominantly Frankish, so their variant of vulgar Latin used many elements from Germanic languages. You also have to remember that the Fortean Schism was not only political, but also- See, that is interesting to me. I didn't know that. I always thought that the, you know, Church Latin, Classical Latin, whatever you want to call it, was codified a long time ago. And then basically because people couldn't read and write, the majority of people, you slowly had like the, the vulgar, as it's often called, the vulgar language, the common language, whatever you want to call it, slowly changed into the modern language. It's obviously with like different influences, right? So the, you know, the French being influenced by the Franks and the Germanic languages, um, you know, Spanish and like all these basically different languages arise. Uh, but I, I always thought that like codified Latin had existed for thousands of years. I didn't realize it wasn't codified until much later. That's interesting. So a doctrinal dis I also didn't realize that the church was using a Frankish branch of Latin for at this time either. That's interesting. Pute. And the main doctrinal point of contention was the Filioque clause. Filioque is an addition to the Latin version of the Nicene Creed, which states that the Holy Spirit proceeds both from the Father and the Son, as opposed to just the Father as in the Greek language version. Because these fine theological points often rely on one's mastery of the language, I think it's probable that Michael's original comments were not about the Latin language in itself, but about how the Western clergy introduces barbarisms into liturgy through their use of vulgar Latin. And Anastasius, who was always keen on stirring up the conflict between Rome and Constantinople, knowingly misinterpreted his words so that he could launch into another one of his polemics about how Michael isn't a real Roman emperor. <laughs> it would have been very in character for him, and it would have made much more sense than the Eastern Roman emperor calling Latin a barbarian language, while using it in his court ceremonies and coinage. So what do you think? Let me know in the comments if this version sounds more plausible to you or not. For those of you who want to learn more about this particular topic, I am including a link to a paper called A War of Languages by Evangelos Chrysos, which goes into more detail. I'd also like to thank Mulai Cherkawi, Conventus Orbis, Pikimis, and others for supporting me on Patreon. And for the rest of you, thanks a lot for watching, and I will see you in the next one. Yeah, that's really interesting. I definitely...
I'm on board with that theory 100%. I think if you look at, like, any... Basically, this is, like, the ninth century version of, like, a political ideological debate, right? And they're trying to dunk on straw men uh, in order to gain political brownie points and, you know, push their opinion. And if you see Twitter nowadays, you know, any two people, 99% of the time, if you if you see a debate on Twitter between, you know anyone that have different ideological viewpoints most of the time they're not going to address each other at all right they're they're gonna create straw men they're gonna purposely take stuff out of context and a lot of the time they know they're taking it out of context right they're they're always purposely just disingenuous um in order to justify their opinion which i I always find kind of hilarious because if they had half a brain they'd realize how it like undermines their opinion for anyone who has half a brain but you know that's kind of the one of the downfalls of democracy is that you don't need to convince the smart people. You just need to convince enough of the dumb people. Right. But yeah, that's really interesting. I'd never even heard that rumor before. So this whole thing is new to me, but anyway, let me know what you think below like comment, subscribe. I'll see you guys in the next one.